Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is four o'clock. Calling the May 15th, 2023 Board of Education work session to order. Our first item is our invocation. And we'll ask um, Board Member Leonard Peace if he will lead us in our invocation. Sure, let's bow. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity for a few of us to gather together to take care of the business of students and staff in Graham County Public Schools. We ask that you will be with us as we make decisions that will be beneficial to all. We pray that you will continue to do, help us to do those things that we would do that would be in benefit of everyone that's here. These and all things we pray for in Son Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Next is our Pledge of Allegiance and Board Member Amanda Labrette will lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight's board chair report will be short. We have several items we need to cover before we begin our professional training. Um, the only thing I have to add tonight is that we appreciate everything that everyone has done to make our teachers feel special during Teacher Appreciation Week, from donating gift cards to visits to goodies that have been taken to the schools. It's very much appreciated. Also. Um, many of us have been attending programs throughout the district and they will continue as we approach the end of the year and it's very important to support these students and teachers and uh, our presence is always uh, wanted so hopefully we can continue to get to as many of them as we can it's impossible to get to all but we are hopefully will be able to c cover a whole lot of them by everyone Madam Superintendent, do you have comments? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. I, too, would like to echo that we've had an array of incredible activities, awards programs, field days, events, concerts, and so much more since we last gathered. And I, too, want to thank all of our board members for their support of our students and our educators. It's been phenomenal. I especially want to say thank you for your amazing showing at the Evening of Excellence. We had a fantastic time uh, and I've received so many comments. Thank you so very much. And Teacher Appreciation Week was incredible. The goodies, the gift cards, everything you did to help us celebrate our educators for they are worthy and you helped us make that week so special. I would like to report we had a very engaging and responsive meeting with our sheriff this morning, and I know you will get that report in June, but wanted to uplift that. And this afternoon, I'm so excited, uh, we had our meeting with and celebration of North Carolina Legislators Day with Senator Bodie. She visited Granville Early College High School and our young people were downright phenomenal. They showcased our school there uh, and our district exceptionally well. They were amazing. And every time I visit, it's just incredible to learn even more. When you think you know everything, it's amazing how you learn even more. So it's just been an amazing uh, day much less the last two or three weeks. So what I'll say is don't forget this Friday, our early college students will be graduating. That is 7 p.m. from Vance Granville Community College. That concludes my report. Okay, next on our agenda, we have three consent items, 401, 402, and 403. I hope everyone's had a chance to read through these items. Do we want to make a motion to approve the items as presented if there are no questions or concerns. Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve the uh, consent items. Okay. Second. 
Mr. Pease has made a motion to approve the consent items, and Mrs. Anderson has second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Madam the Chair, carried. there's a um, few things that I would like to add to the agenda, if possible. Would you name what items there are, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, so uh, the first would be um, an agenda item to discuss uh, shifting one of our SRO positions from the Grand Granville County Sheriff's Office um, to the Creemore Police Department. Um, the second item would be uh, a discussion about us um, pursuing an MOU memorandum of understanding with the county commissioners um, to fulfill the 16 SRO positions to cover every campus and um, one more motion um, that I would like to discuss or agenda item that I would like to put on the uh, the agenda would be for us to have a discussion um, about pursuing some public information requests from the sheriff's office for some clarification about some information that he gave today. So I would recommend we make that 5.03 and add that to the agenda. I'm sorry, the board needs to vote to amend the agenda. So that would be a motion. Yes, yes ma'am. Do we have a motion to amend the agenda? as stated by Mrs. Hayes. Well, I have something I'd like to add as well. If that can happen at the same time or it needs to happen separate at a separate motion. time. Okay. So uh, will we take that to be your motion to add those three Sure, things? that's my motion sure. to add those three things. <laughs> Seconded. Gary. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. And then I'd just like to make a motion to uh, add time to discuss the email we got this afternoon from uh, Attorney Howard's office. Um, anytime that we get any kind of correspondence from a law firm, I feel like that's something we should discuss uh, urgently. So that would be my motion to add a point for discussion for that. That's item 5.05, .05, if added. 5.04, pardon me, 5.04. Okay. Dr. Frederick has made a motion to add that to the agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Who made the second? Ms. Anderson. Ms. Anderson. <clears throat> I have a question. The question is, we have a person coming in in a little while to do this. Are we going to have time to do that? Because his motion is probably going to take some time maybe to discuss. I mean, from my perspective, discussing something of legal nature is more important than an optional training. So um, that's my perspective. I'd like, I think it's important for us to dedicate the time to it while we can, rather than table it for several weeks. Any other discussion? I would like, uh, yeah, I think that he makes a very good point and definitely would like to have that discussion as well. So are we saying that based on our time limitation, do we have actually a time limitation here? You know, I know we meet at 4. Well, our people are supposed to be here starting close to 4.30. 4.30. You could do it at the end if you'd like. Hmm. You could do it at the end if you'd like. You could add it after the training and reconvene you needed to do that. I don't, I don't have a strong preference, I guess. Just hmm? just Our people have just arrived in the lobby. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I will, I'm gonna say one thing. Um, can I turn it over to our vice chair just a moment? Sure. I don't know about everybody else, but I just got the letter and I'm still digesting what I read. I would think it would be good if we all digested what we read before we talk about it. That's just my opinion. Well, there's, there's a motion on the floor to uh, include that. There was a suggestion to do it after the presentation that we were going to get supposedly at 430. So, uh, I mean, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir, but I think the motion was just to add it to the agenda. I don't think that matters when in the agenda that is, if that's part of, unless I need to amend my motion. No, well, my, my, if it's okay, I mean, I don't have a problem with adding it after the uh, works, after the session that we're going to have, which would be 
probably like 5, 5.30 at the latest. What time, Sergeant? Is our training to end? The PD was 4.30 to 6 p.m. It was an hour and a half, but. Uh, so if we did it afterwards, it would have to be like at 6 o'clock. So you're going to digest it more between 4.30 and 6? I'm not, but it's not I would like to. Yeah, I, I haven't read it. I do. There are people on the board that haven't read it, really. No, I really haven't. And I think if it's as important as uh, I'm hearing it is, mm -hmm. we should at least be able to read it and have a decision about what it's about and what we need to do about it if it affects us in any way. So from what I'm hearing, the motion is to do it. <clears throat> is to do it today and the question is whether we do it now or after the session well and i guess point of clarification i mean mine was it's just a discussion not an action item and i think those can live separately on the agenda so um, this is not a, anything for us to make any action over just an opportunity to discuss was what i made a motion for or can you can can you would it be appropriate for you to amend your motion to have that discussion after the presentation if, if necessary i can okay um so i i actually would like to <clears throat> as far as doing it after the this optional um training i'm going to be totally honest i wasn't planning on staying for the training i have now done two dei trainings <laughs> for the symphony since january and so I really was planning on not staying. And if this is going to be something that we're going to discuss, I would really prefer that we do it prior to that training. Anyone else? So there, there's a motion that people are saying should, we should do it before the uh, training. So the board needs to vote on whether we do it before or after. Well, I think the motion on the floor, if I may, was just to add it to the agenda. Okay. Um, and the recommendation from the superintendent was to put it at 5.04. Not a recommendation. I did want her to know that was an option. Or op yeah, the yeah, option from option. the superintendent was to put it at 5.04 <clears throat> because my previous agenda additions were 5.03. Well, what we're voting on is whether we're going to add it to the agenda or not. Correct. All in favor of adding it to the agenda, let it be known by the sound of Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Can I get a show of hands? For what? For which one? For what? Whether you wanted to do it before? That was the first question. Mm. Well, just no, you heard today. I think it was four to three. Isn't that correct? Three opposed? I guess I'm, can we, I know we've got a lot going. <laughs> I want to make sure, because I have not read what, so, what's being, what right. we're discussing yeah. right now, what we're talking about. So whether to add it to the agenda passed. Well, I, maybe I'm not sure. Ms. Anderson, what was your vote? Well, when you said add it to the agenda, you talking about after, are we saying we today? Was, it wasn't specified, yeah. but just today as opposed to in, in a later meeting. At a later meeting. So, all in favor of adding this item to the agenda, let it be known by the raising of your hand. Today. T today. Yeah. So we have three. All opposed, let it be known by raising your hand. So the motion Failed three to four. And that was just a motion to do it today. today. Mm -hmm. Is there another motion? I mean, I guess I'd like to make a motion to add it to the next meeting's agenda. Again, for discussion, not for action. You really don't need to make a motion for that because we, okay. we will add it okay that's a request right. certainly we'll do that okay it's, it's your thing okay 
Thank you. Sounds good. Okay. The contract, consent items for a 1 CEI contract, for a 2 audit contract, and for a 3 approval of meeting minutes from October 3rd, 2022. Do we have a motion to approve the consent items? We, we already did, we that. did that. We did that. Okay. I'm sorry. I got tangled up listening to all this. Okay. Our next item is in policy 5.01 audit response. Thank you so much. We'll be hearing from Vicki, Mrs. Hines. Will Ms. you take it away for us? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, board. Uh, members, um, as, uh, as, as you know, our 2021-2022 our audit was recently um, presented by our auditors, and because there was a finding in that, within that audit, um, we are required to submit an audit response to that, basically letting the um, Local Government Commission know what we have in place to make sure that, that those, the, the, the things that made our audit late will not happen again, will be corrected. So attached is the letter for your review, and with your approval, I will um, send it a, around for signatures. And basically, basically um, the, the, the response is that um, obviously our, our audit finding was that um, the, the audit was delayed due to the lack of the, the delay in balancing our general ledger accounts. And that was due to uh, training, um, a training need on my own part, and, um, and, 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 and getting those, those items done. That training has since taken place, and we have been able to maintain our accounts as, as would be expected um, since, since that time. Um, and basically what, what you see here is simply just a very basic response as well as the internal controls that have been updated to reflect what we're doing to make sure that this stays in place. Um, I just I do want to be clear that you know uh, the the criteria or the condition was that um, management did not reconcile bank or other various general ledger accounts that kind of hurts my feelings just a little bit um, it was simply the June bank statement that was delayed in getting reconciled because of a misposting of a journal entry and I didn't have the training at that time to find what the error was in the system so we've done that now so we don't anticipate there being and um, that kind of late uh, submission moving forward are there any questions? Vicki, we appreciate you stepping into this role this year and doing absolutely everything and more that was needed for us to have a clean audit mm -hmm. and for this to be a finding we certainly understand. Thank you. Thank you. What is it we need to do as the result of this, dear? Basically, I, I, there is a place for each of you to sign on this lovely letter that we have. So if, if it works for you all, then I will just pass it around. Thank you. And, and you all can sign. Okay. Board okay? members, Mrs. Hines will pass this around as we continue with the meeting, if that's all right with mm -hmm. you. And this will bring closure to the audit this year. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Perfect. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate all your hard work. We're now down to the item 502, school start and stop times. Dr. Thank Winborn, you. take it away. Dr. Winborn and Mr. Graham have been working very closely with uh, our transportation department <coughs> to bring to you something that is now in policy. So they are going to share this with you. Um, and, and they've been putting in a lot of hours on this, so we hope this is something you'll be able to assist us with so that we can get it out to our parents in the community. Dr. Winborn and Mr. Graham. Thank you, Dr. McClain. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, Vice Chair, members of the board. Um, Mr. Connor, if you could please open the other item, uh, the slide deck first. Um, for quite some time, we've been, we've been wanting to standardize our start and stop times for the district. Um, and we have made adjustments administratively uh, up until now, but in May, you approved a revision to policy 3300, which now includes uh, a paragraph which 
stipulates that the board needs to approve start and stop times for our schools. So Mr. Graham and I uh, have been working on this with lots of other stakeholders. And um, we are bringing to you tonight some minor adjustments that we believe will be an improvement, uh, not only for our children, but their families and our staff. So um, what you see here um, are the new start and stop times for all elementary schools. All elementary schools will start and stop on the same time. That has not been the case for quite a while. It'll be from 7.45 to 2.55, which means um, 370 minutes of instructional time each day. And if you, are, if you were to look in the other document, which you don't need to pull up right now, Mr. Connor, but that's more for your reference, you'll see there's a spreadsheet that Mr. Graham and I have created that does the calculations for us. Um, we are required to submit to DPI each year uh, this information, and so we, we do a very careful job of monitoring this. But this will result in about 50, in exactly 51 uh, surplus instructional hours. And if you, say, if you think, well, <clears throat> there's more or less about six hours, six hours and 10 minutes uh, in a day, that's approximately, you know, eight or nine extra days we have built into our calendar for elementary. Now this year we haven't had to use very many because we didn't have much inclement weather. But that is our typical practice is to keep, you know, at least a week and a half kind of in the bank. As you all know, it's you know, not unusual for us to have a crazy winter or have a hurricane in this fall and a crazy winter. So we don't want to have to be making up school a lot on Saturdays or extending the school year because that causes its own other set of problems. So in any case, that this is a proposal for elementary, and Mr. Connor, if you go to the next slide. Um, middle school is a little different. We had to look at this on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Um, the asterisks beside Butnerston Middle School and Northern Granville Middle School indicate that those are schools with a different calendar due to their restart status. And those schools have elected to build in additional early release or work days into their schedule. So even though their school day is about 10 minutes longer and their instructional minutes uh, are about are 10 minutes longer per day, it, it balances out with their surplus hours because of the additional time that they're taking off during the school year. Um, Holly Middle School will now start at 8 o'clock and stop at 3. The reason for that um, is Mr. Graham's been working with DOT uh, they have, have stipulated that the start and stop times for Hawley and South Granville need to have a minimum of 30 minutes buffer between to help alleviate some of the congestion with traffic, uh, car traffic in that area. <coughs> um, we wanted to keep high schools on the schedule that they've always been at, 8.30 to 3.30. That works very well for athletics and all of the other events that occur. So the only choice with Holly was to either have them start at 8 or start at 9. And 9 o'clock is just simply too late, and it would have really disrupted after-school events. <coughs> also worth noting is that um, there will be a 15-minute buffer between the start of elementary schools and Holly. So those families that have siblings at multiple schools, there will be a little bit of staggered time there for them. Mr. kind of the last slide uh, is, again, just, just the high school calendar. <coughs> uh, start and stop times. And that, again, that is not changing from this year. Noting, of course, early college has a different schedule. So uh, there is another spreadsheet, if, if you'd like to refer to that, and just get into the nuts and bolts of the daily uh, deductions and so forth. Happy to try to answer questions. Mr. Graham's happy to take questions about Hawley and South Granville. Um, but what we're proposing tonight, next slide, Mr. Connor, is that you approve all starts and stop times as presented. Any questions? What is our um, current earliest start time for <coughs> elementary school? Currently, I believe it's 7.45. Let me check real quick. I can pull it up. 7.30, right? OK, so we won't be going any earlier than what oh, some of them already start. Oh, no. Oh, no. 7.25. <coughs> OK. Butner Elementary, 7.30. Cradle, Creedmoor, Mount Energy are all 725. Gotcha. Okay. I have a question, Dr. Wormore. For schools, uh, parents dropping off children, say, that have to be in school at 
745, what's the earliest they're able to drop the child off at most schools? 15 that's minutes early? That's a great question. Uh, we actually discussed that in the elementary principals meeting. Currently the practice, it, it varies a little bit, anywhere from 25 to 40 minutes, depending on when the school currently this year starts. But I've asked that we standardize that for next year and that we provide supervision. We're looking at um, proposing 30 minutes prior to the start of school. Will you also try to standardize that for the middle schools as well? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Motion to approve as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Okay, we have come to the point where we will be needing to have a motion to go into closed session. Oh, wait, we added, uh, we added those ag three agenda items. 5.03, I'm sorry. <coughs> to shift the SRO. Oh, the SRO, I'm sorry. I had my mind on all the stuff that we were talking about. Okay. Okay, so the first one was, um, to discuss the shifting of one SRO position that is currently held by the Granville County Sheriff's Office to um, the Creed Moore Police Department. That's correct. Okay. That was agreed upon this morning. I can talk about department. it. Okay. So in our meeting this morning um, with the sheriff, um, he did say that he would be happy to. Um, give us that transfer so to, to uh, you know allow one of those positions to be transferred to the Creedmoor Police Department um, and I also um, took the liberty of reaching out to um, Creedmoor to make sure that this was something that they were interested to as well and I think you had had some we did we spoke with the chief this weekend right and he's very much so in support of this as well we are utilizing a grant position, so we are not talking money, we're talking people in position. Okay, because I know that the, the position that they currently have is one that's reimbursed by the county, so we would not be just duplicating that, we would be doing something different. Well, we do need to get into details, but we are not talking about duplicating at this point, we were talking a grant position. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Graham, I, I had a question about that too because it would involve changes to our contract. Mm -hmm. So is this one of the positions that funded is funded locally through a grant or some of your positions are paid by the county? Correct. If you know. Correct. It depends on how that, uh, what that is. <laughs> the <coughs> will not pay for high school but otherwise it'll pay for the others, so. So it would be not adding a position, but. That's correct. Just transferred. Not necessarily adding a position at all. One that currently exists plus the conversation right. Right. that they cannot fill at the present. Asking the Creedmoor PD to fill it instead. And so the thinking is, is that when we correct. move the Hawley School into Creedmoor City Limits onto the current Creedmoor campus, that then they would be able to provide that full-time SRO that at service. the middle school, utilizing correct. the grant funding. Correct. Well, if Creedmoor will do that, I think it's a win-win situation for the Sheriff's Department and for the school system. Absolutely. Correct. Do we need to vote on these things? I think we maybe one at a time. <coughs> so I think that what we would do, is, I mean, you can vote on it today, mm -hmm. but we'll have to ch bring the new contract back to you we will. for okay. you to approve at that time. Um, so I think we were looking for our board to one be knowledgeable about what we were doing mm -hmm. so that we were just not functioning as a committee right. and superintendent and accepting but that our board was aware what we were doing and they tasked me with getting with our attorney in compiling for the mm -hmm. sheriff's department an MOU that singular yeah. document yeah. and this letter to go to the Creedmoor police department yeah I mean I think we would we would add a second MOU with Creedmoor. So. 
we would have one with the okay. county and one with Creedmoor. So maybe a vote to send the correspondence from mm -hmm. the entire board to Absolutely. the city of Creedmoor? That would be great. Mm -hmm. That would be sure. Because the chief would like to get something to the city of Creedmoor. Right. The, the chief would like to send it. Right. So yeah, motion to approve those communications with the city of Creedmoor? Second. We have a second. Second. Would you please second it? All in favor? Aye. 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 And was the motion to the city of Creedmoor to the chief for him to be able to do what he'd like to? That. <laughs> Thank you for that. Appreciate the clarification. <laughs> we like to keep our partners happy. <laughs> that was the ask of yes. me. Thank you. And the third item that you had mentioned. Oh, this, so the second one was um, to um, start so a discussion about pursuing an MOU with the county commissioners for 16 positions mm -hmm. of SR, for SROs. Yeah. Attorney Dubison, this impacts you as well, helping us with this. Well, I'm, and that's easily done. I think the question is who's going to pay for it? So I think the purpose, <coughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, was the purpose of the MOU was to have those the need for those positions created so that when the grant opening um, opens up within the legislature that then this year we would be able to apply for the grant funding to cover the additional positions that we were not able to apply for last year. It makes us eligible. That's correct. To apply. Okay. So it's with the intention of pursuing the grant funding to cover them. So if in the contract we'd have to put something like if funded we would have this many That's positions. Correct. Okay. If they're not written that way, we're not able to pursue the funding. Now is that 16, so it's 15, right, and one with Creedmoor? Okay. Is that right? 15 two with the county, one with So it'd be two with Creedmoor. Two, two with Creedmoor, and how many with the county? And 14 with the county. 15 schools. 14. We go down to 14. Okay. Well, if I may, we, we also discussed the possibility of other municipal law enforcement agencies we joining did. that at some point. Keep maybe keeping some language in there to allow that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that if if we find ourselves in a position where we do get the funding, but the sheriff's department doesn't have the personnel to be able to fulfill those positions, that then we could open it up to possibly <laughs> Oxford Police Department or Butner Public Safety, or even STEM. Because it sounds like there's some things already in conversation with some other branches right already underway right. so we don't want to lock ourselves in um, because it sounds like the sheriff's department and the other chiefs are already in conversation about expansion and we know from our conversation with commissioners that is a goal and so we certainly want to be a part of that solution is that a good way to put and it? doesn't this give us more flexibility and how we use our funds if we can get grants and so forth it does. and moving it does. the money around a little bit more flexibility so do, is that an act do we perceive that as an action item do we need to vote to have the attorney just, write that up is that is that necessary i don't know that that's necessarily action as much as it is to make everyone aware okay that this is occurring because i don't know that that ball is in our court unless my colleagues <clears throat> feel differently Vicki, what, what is your thought? No, I'm just thinking that the, the, the ball may be the, the creation of the MOU um, and and requesting that the, that the sheriff's office uh, signs and, and the other Absolutely. municipalities. Right, and I just wasn't sure like how, because I know we need board approval for any contract over 100000 so I, I just wasn't mm -hmm. sure if an MOU is similar to a contract in that way. It is. Um, now, okay. in this case, Yes, it is. And even though I'm not sure if your current MOU with law enforcement takes you over that amount in terms of the funds that it requires, we generally bring it to the board anyway just because it's we a governance do. issue. Um, so if you needed an action tonight, I think the action would be to direct the administration to pursue such an MOU, you know, to expand our MOU, understanding that the final would come back to the board. The other reason we're 
sort of addressing this and putting it on steroids a bit is because our current contracts expire June 30th. Okay. And we don't want this to sunset without a plan. So we could very well go ahead and do what the attorney just said. <laughs> Anybody? So motion to uh, approve as attorney do and said. Like that not for Frederick? <laughs> to pursue we'll an MOU. Yeah, to pursue an MOU uh, with the uh, specific language referencing the grant access as well as the local municipalities that might be able to amend their interest in said contract as well. Do we have a second? <laughs> second. Second by Ms. Lindsay. Nancy. Well said. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Yeah. Thank you all so very much. So there's you just, had a third one. Right. So there's just one more. And again, this is um, more of a sharing of information. Um, we had a lot of information shared this morning at the sheriff's um, at the meeting with the sheriff and um, some great exchange and great conversation. Um, one of the things, though, that I found concerning was there was an incident brought up um, by Mr. Peace about a concern from the community um, at Granville Central earlier this year. And there was um, a picture taken of a couple of employees from the Sheriff's Department at Granville Central inside the building and they um, all were openly carrying. The information that was received was that not everybody in the photo that was carrying a firearm, um, the, the alleged information that was received, was that um, not everybody was, had the legal authority to carry a firearm that was pictured in the photo. And so personally, um, I have a concern about that, that there might have been the illegal carrying of a firearm on one of our campuses. And, um, I would actually like for this board to consider allowing Attorney Dubison to do a public information request from the Sheriff's Department um, to find out if this individual was sworn in as a deputy and what that date was and then also if they had the legal authority at the time to carry a firearm because carrying a firearm on a school campus when you're not legally authorized is a felony I believe and that's a big concern of mine is if we're allowing people that are not qualified or not legally authorized to do that um, I think that sends a very dangerous message and so I just want to be like crystal clear about whether or not what happened was completely legal or not The, the excuse me. The sheriff responded to your question this morning about mm -hmm. that, and uh, it might be beneficial for our attorney to talk to the sheriff in order to get to know exactly what he was say what he said about that. Because I don't remember what he said, but I know he, he he responded to it, and I think he said something about he could do do that if he wanted to. But I'm, I wouldn't swear to that, so I would advise. <coughs> uh, you already have that conversation. Well, he, um, I asked the question uh, if the person in question was authorized to carry a firearm on a school campus, and he indicated that they were, that any employee of the sheriff's department is, off, is under his authority. But the, he also confirmed that this person was not sworn in as a law enforcement officer until after this alleged incident. And so I just have a question about whether or not the authority is given to this person as an employee, because that just means that any old administrative assistant could open carry in our schools if any employee of the Sheriff's Department is allowed to carry a firearm on our school campus. That doesn't make much sense to me, but I'm not an attorney, so I could be wrong. Did he indicate that they were detention officers? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, he also indicated, again, he confirmed that this person was not sworn in until after the incident. I believe he said February 16th. After the 16th. Right. Or on the 16th. I think he said on the 16th. Right. <coughs> Which was after. 
Yes, and the alleged incident occurred on February the 14th. I'm, it's at the pleasure of the board. I mean, I mean, I can tell you what the law says about <coughs> who can carry a firearm if that would be helpful. Um, and there's an exception, obviously, for law enforcement officers, but also for meaning firearms are prohibited on school property except for law enforcement officers, firefighters, emergency service personnel, forest service personnel, detention officers employed by and authorized by the sheriff to carry firearms, and any private police employed by the school when acting in the discharge of their official duties. So it sounds like we're unclear whether we fall in these categories or not. Right. So the question is, so you obviously said detention officer. The mm -hmm. question is, is if they weren't a sworn officer at the time, mm -hmm. what is that, like where is that, that seems, it's just a little gray. Okay. That's all. Just looking for clarification on that. <coughs> so do we need to make a motion if we wanted to move forward with just the information gathering component of what Ms. Hayes recommended? I mean, any one of you can request the information, but I think if, if you're asking me to do it, it would be best to do it in a motion. In this circumstance, is there an advantage to having you do it versus us legally? I don't have access to any more information than you do. Um, I'm not sure there's a legal difference, but there may be a practical difference. I mean, there's a reason why you prefer it. Just my biggest concern is like safety on our campuses. Mm -hmm. It's a top concern that we all have. And I would hope that, you know, and if any liability did come from any sort of situation, it would, all, it would fall back on all of us, not any one member. And that's why I was just proposing that mm -hmm. Attorney Davison mm -hmm. pursue it. Then I'll make a motion for Attorney Dubison to pursue the investigation, or I guess uh, information request about the, this circumstance. Do we have a second? Second. Any more discussion? <coughs> Ready to vote? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I think we're now ready to adjourn to closed session. Do I have a motion to go into closed session for the purposes set forth in our agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. We'll give. I'm very excited to make the motion that we approve Stan Winborn as our next superintendent. I know this is something that he has been working for very hard and he's been preparing for this for quite some time. So I'm just very excited to make this motion. Second. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion to approve contract to point. Dr. Stan Winborn is our next superintendent, effective July 1. Um, motion has been made by Mandela Breck. Do we have a second? I second it. Second has been made by Daniel Hayes. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion is passed unanimously. Congratulations, Dr. Winborn. I don't know if we want to hold these people up very long, but uh, I know all of us feel the same way that you have a history of accomplishment in our school system and you've led with always the focus on children and what their needs are. And that's very important to this board. You've got a lot of experience and you're gonna have to remember all those things <laughs> <laughs> that you've done and when uh, reading your resume and all of your accomplishments and roles that you've had in our school system um, it's it boggles the mind because you've had such a variety of things that you've worked with and I think that will be a true asset to our system thank you so much for wanting to be a part of our school system Madam Chair I think you ought to give me at least five seconds to say something <laughs> 
You want to say something, Dr. Dr. Winborn, that is. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I'm honored and humbled by your decision uh, for the confidence that you're placing in me. I'm grateful. Um, you know, Granville County Public Schools is my home, and uh, this, is, this is where I live, and my children have come through the schools, as you all know, and um, I just look forward to continuing to serve. I know that I do have some large shoes to fill, though. Um, I'm very grateful for the leadership of our superintendent, Dr. McLean, um, who's ushered us through some very difficult and challenging times, and uh, she's been a mentor to me, and she's taught me a lot, and uh, it's very, this is bittersweet. I'm gonna miss you, Dr. McLean, and, and I, I thank you for everything um, that you've, you've done for me and for the children of our school district. And so I'm honored and I'm grateful and I look forward to, uh, to serving. So thank you. Thank you. You know, I can't let this moment pass me by. I feel like a proud mama. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Winborn, you're gonna make an excellent superintendent and I am extremely proud of you. I really am and to our Board of Education, congratulations making a fine choice this evening. I will be looking forward to reading and listening <laughs> <laughs> to lots that will be going on, but you have complete confidence. I have complete confidence in the decision you've made this evening. Congratulations, Dr. Winborn. <laughs> Anyone else before we adjourn for our Professional training. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned. Oh, real quickly, there are list of activities coming up. It's pretty long, so just be sure you read through them and don't forget we have graduation on Friday night at Dennis Granville for our early college. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. McLean because she knows these people very well um, that are going to conduct our training today and we're delighted to have them so I'm going to turn it over to her for right now. Wonderful. Well, we are honored to have with us this evening two of North Carolina's finest educators who both have track records. Uh, in public education concerning many of the issues some of you may have seen on television. I mean, some of you know they're educators who've been in our state for many years, but at the present, they work with our public school for, uh, forum and the Dudley Flood Center, particularly around issues of equity and opportunity. And so when our chair and vice chair asked that we address these concerns, um, several names came to the forefront, but these two have presented all over our state and have done so in such an eloquent manner that we thought it would be a great choice for our board and our district. So at this time, I'm so proud to present, present Dr. Deanna Townsend-Smith and Dr. Mary Ann Wolf. Let's welcome them to Granville County Public <coughs> Schools. Thank you so much. We're delighted to be here. And as we were preparing for this, Deanna and I both talked about wanting to make sure that you know our own experience uh, with boards. Um, so I was a member of the Chapel Hill Carborough City School Board for several years. So while my, my career goes from teaching all the way to this, the policy work I've been doing for some time and a lot of professional learning, I do think that just deeply understanding the challenges and complexities of the role of the school board, the role of district leadership, the role of principals um, and teachers is really important and having sat in the shoes that many of you are in um, understand that and how much you take on that is often behind the scenes and people don't know all the work it takes to prepare and be ready for this work. So we really appreciate you making time for us. We know you're busy. We know there's a lot going on, but also know that we come very grounded in that. And so I am the daughter of an educator, so I feel like I've been 
in the teaching realm since I was born and uh, <laughs> you know my summers were when my mom was teaching summer school hanging out and there are still some cassette tapes floating around of me singing good morning to you that my mom played every day so um, really appreciate being here but also appreciate the the challenges that you all have before you as well and I am Deanna Townsend Smith I've been in education for over 20 years it feels weird to say that out loud mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think I've made it my mission to shepherd boards. <laughs> so um, worked locally with uh, boards of education and also had the pleasure and the honor of serving as uh, the director for the North Carolina State Board of Education for a number of years where I shepherded their uh, policy work and um, their operations. So all their day-to-day -day operations. Um, that was me for the last three and a half years so until I transitioned to, to this role. And so now I have the distinguished honor of serving uh, at the Dudley Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity, which is a life, which is a, a mouthful, but ultimately we exist to eradicate educational inequities across the state and to continue forward the legacy of one of North Carolina's greatest heroes, Dr. Dudley Flood. Excellent. And uh, we're so pleased to both be with you today. So we wanted to just give you the shortest of backgrounds about the Public School Forum. Um, our mission is to ensure that every child in North Carolina has access to a high quality and equitable education. And we work to inspire meaningful action on North Carolina's most important public education issues. One of the things I think that's been so important and helpful for our work is that we spend a lot of time impacting policy making recommendations, sharing information, but every single day I get to work with teachers and principals and superintendents who and school boards who are on the ground doing work. And so that translation role of making sure we lift up those voices and then also inform policy, but also sometimes explaining, I don't know if you know, but this is what this policy could do to impact you and the kids in your district is really important. And so we have a long history, almost 40 years of policy and research the Public School Forum led the Teaching Fellows Program that many of you know from before. There is a new version. We are not responsible for that one, but we had a long history there. And we do have three centers. So in addition to the Dudley Flood Center, we also have the North Carolina Center for Resilience and Learning, which focuses on trauma-informed practices and how do we understand each child and how that impacts neuroscience, their brain, and learning. Um, and also we have the North Carolina Center for After School Programs because we see deep connections, you know the needs in your own community for out of school time um, opportunities for kids. So these are just a couple of the things that we do. So Dr. McLean mentioned our TV show, that's our Ed Matters. Um, we also have a Rural Teacher Leader Network, the Color of Education, Education Policy Fellowship. But every one of these is always towards kids and focused on kids and educators and how do we make sure that we are continuing to grow access to opportunities for them. So what I would love to do, because we do want to know who's in the room, because as much as we know some of you, we don't know all of you, we'd love for you each to share kind of in a sprint version, that's what I call this, um, your name, your role, and then what are you most proud of with Granville County Schools? And I think the new superintendent might get to go first. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> uh -oh. The newly named, how about that? I think yeah. that's how we have to say it. There are a lot of things I'm proud of, but uh, probably what f comes to mind first is um, the feeling as an organization that we are a family, um, that we care about one another, and um, we operate with the same interests in mind. That's what's best for our kids. Wonderful. Uh, Jamar Perry, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources. Uh, most proud the integrated uh, programs that are here in the district. Innovative School, uh, the Grand Academy, and the work that's been done here to provide students with choice and opportunity. Wonderful. <coughs> Hello, Lindsay. I'm just the most proud of Grand County Schools, never giving up. Although we lost kids, we still find a way to uh, bounce back and show we're still a great school system, system here and that we are really trying to make our brand, our county as being one of the best school systems that are around. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, that piece, I'm, uh, I guess, most proud of the way administration 
works with the board in order to give every child in this county the opportunity to be successful. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eva Dudes, and I'm the board's attorney. So as an outside editor, I don't think I can say what I'm proud of, but I can say I'm impressed with the amount of um, direct interaction I see between the employees I work with and children and their parents on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, up to the superintendent and the board members. Hi, I'm Glenda Williams. I'm on the board, obviously. Um, it's too many things to really name one specific, but just for a few. Uh, I'm proud that we serve all children, um, no matter what their special needs are. Um, we, we find a place for them and try to serve them to the best of our ability. I'm very proud of our administration that is very child-centered, always looking for ways to improve things for children. And I'm extremely proud of our teachers who have weathered the COVID and have worked so hard over the last year or so to make up for lost time and gone way beyond the call of duty and the many hours they put in to the uh, school system. So I'm proud to be a part of it. I went through it, my children did, and my grandchildren. So I, I, I have a heart for the school system. Thank, Thank you. you. Elisa McLean. Um, one tonight, I'm proud of Dr. Winborn. <laughs> He's right at the top of my list. Um, I'm also proud of the collegial relationships in this district. People genuinely care about people here and they care about the children and the families they serve and that's right at the, the, the center of everything that happens. And, and that's not to say everything is perfect, but that's, that's one of the things that makes me very proud. And I've worked in several districts across the state and that, that's always something where I can say with confidence that if you let us just talk for a minute, I, I bet we can take good care of you because you know people's hearts. And that's always made me proud. Hi, I'm Ethel Anderson, board member, and I am really proud of just the fellowship and the working together of everyone for the school for the same purpose. We have the same focus. We all focus on our children and getting them, you know, through where they're going through the schools, and they're our future leaders. So we have to be here to focus on our future leaders, and it's just great. I did not come up in the Granville County school system, been living in Granville County for the last 12 years, but always, youth has always been the focus, the youth, and being here working, working to support our children and our future leaders, I'm in for it. Wonderful. Vicki Hines, I'm a finance officer, and um, I'm proud of our focus on continuous improvement. Um, the idea that um, the status quo is never we just never, we, we look at critically, constructively, our processes are everything we do and constantly work towards it. Wonderful. Well, I actually think what you're proud of fits beautifully with our goals for today, actually. And so um, one thing we'll start out by saying is we could have spent an entire day or two or three with you um, on this work. Um, but we know that we don't have that. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll keep you here all night. Um, but we did have some key goals defining equity. We want to really connect equity with the context here in Granville and we think that's very important. We also want to make sure that we develop and think about how the community here and having a sense of belonging and equity actually all connect with academic learning. And so you can't really have one without the other and we'll spend some time talking about that. And we would love to leave with a few next steps or suggestions for next steps as well. Um, and so um, we do know, are you going to take this part or am I taking me? Okay. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was start by grounding, like what are we charged to do, right, as a school district in North Carolina. And our state constitution ensures and says that every child has the right to a sound basic education. Um, and while there are many different discussions about what that may or may not mean, 
we know that that means we need to have a high quality teacher and a high quality principal and we need to support students from early childhood through post-secondary to make sure there's a finance system that supports those students and that we're looking at the many different facets of our kids and so this is grounded in our constitution that we do this um, and I think that's very important. We also know that when you look at your own strategic plan um, that um, Oh, can you click to that? Yes. That you all have several key areas um, that really also align with this. So first of all, we love that you have this strategic plan. We know that's not easy um, and it takes deep work to get there. Um, but we also highlighted three areas. I know that financial and human capital matters tremendously in all of this. But as we were looking through this for the lens of today, we see those deep connections that you want academic success, you want health and safety in students, um, even the language that you use in that, right? That they're safe physically, environmentally, and socially, but also how does that fit in with your community and how does that fit in with communication? And so we applaud you for having all those aspects as well as the critical ones that make sure everything is possible, um, but wanted to make sure we grounded our work in that. This isn't something on the side, this isn't something extra, this is in your strategic plan, our Constitution requires it, so how do we move forward? And then just to add on to that, um, as, as we looked at these as well, saw great alignment between your strategic plan priorities and the goals that the State Board of Education has set out for the state. And so we know that in order to get to a similar destination that we want to for each and every child, we must all be working towards similar goals. And so these three areas do align with what the State Board of Education defined in its strategic plan in 2019 around equity and whole child. And so there were three broad goals for the entire state to accomplish by 2025. And so they just recently updated that to accomplish them by 2027. So this alignment as we think about next steps is critical. And I think we're good there, Deanna, if you wanna go ahead and jump to the next one. So I heard a variety of different things as you were talking, uh, as you were introducing yourselves and talking about the things that you were most proud of. Um, and what I heard from many of you is this piece of care. Ultimately, at the end of the day, like one of my favorite people, Dr. Dudley Flo, who I have the distinct pleasure of working with, um, often says that that's where this, this work starts. It's hard work. And it's about reaching each and every child where, where he or she is. And so we want to spend some time this afternoon looking at this picture. And Marianne is going to pass, or we're going to pass some papers down so that we can, uh, as a group, think about what is your individual definition of equity when you're looking at this picture. What is your individual definition of equity? And then think, think through this piece of like equality. What is your individual definition of equality and how do those two things merge? And is it, is it important to have a definition between these two words? So we're gonna give you about a minute to write down your definition. <clears throat> And Deanna, just to clarify, are they just doing equity or which do you want them to do? I think. I think, yes, think equity? Yes. Yeah, focus on equity, your definition for equity. I think that's good. Oh, you'll have your
All right. So it looks like we are winding down writing this definition of equity. So we're going to split the room up into two. So we want this group to discuss your definition of equity, your individual definitions of equity. We want this side of the room to discuss your individual definitions of equity. I'm sorry, I'll keep this mic to my to my mouth. <laughs> uh, yeah, we might suggest you stand in little circles oh, in okay. each side to do that. <laughs> Y'all stand around me, I won't have to get up. That's what we tell me to do. Stand around you. You know how we talk about leadership. <laughs> so, equity is what we're supposed to decide on. Discuss. Discuss my, my, my. Thing on it is, <laughs> even though everybody started the same things, you have to figure out a way for them to become equal and have the same opportunities to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And that's a perfect picture of that because uh, some start out by being behind the fence, but in the end, everybody was able to see over that, which moved from uh, one point to equity. I have a, that's my story. the same thing you had about Sister Arnold. Providing the same opportunity to all. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
know, which is expensive. It's not fair because we are spending a lot more money on a child that is in a wheelchair. But it's giving them the same opportunity to do the opportunities on the second floor for those classes. <laughs> so we've had some great conversations and while, I ha while we hadn't planned this originally I want someone from this group to summarize what your definition of equity was and then someone from this group to summarize what the definition of equity is and then as a group we will then talk about equity together. So who wants to begin? Those on my right or those on my left? We'll go first. All right, thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't have any, you don't have any. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peace nominated me. He just has to practice his leadership skills. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So um, we, we had some very similar takes on our definition. Uh, the, what I wrote down that I think was echoed by everyone in our group was that equity is ensuring equal access to opportunity. Um, and that, go, that happens without sacrificing the standards for achievement or excellence. And we talked a lot about this graphic. Um, if the fence line is the standard, um, we're providing different supports so that students can get to that standard. We're not lowering the fence line. You know, the fence is that level. Um, so we, we had a great conversation. It was really, I think everyone was in agreement. Mm -hmm. Anything to add that I miss? Mr. Perry? Great job. <laughs> great. Thank you. Okay. We sort of talked about equity as being fair to children, meeting every child where they are. In other words, you can't just do the same thing for every child. Some children need more intensive services like special needs children or children maybe that could not have pre-K school or come to school behind. So it means that we have to differentiate our instruction and do the things that will get those kids closer or to that standard that we want them to be. 
Um, that's pretty much we, we talked about that. And we, we talked also about, and when you talk about fairness, we have our schools, public schools are often compared to schools that do not serve different populations. Uh, for instance, we have some schools that serve a large percentage of children with special needs. Their test scores are lumped in there. We have other schools that have a much lower percentage. So it's very hard to make a comparison when the public sees the grades. And, oh, well, that school's in C or D. That school's a B. You have to really dig down into your data to see what group of kids you're working with and what kind of resources you need to work with them. So that's some of the, some of the issues we discussed. So as you were talking about each of your, your respective definitions as a group, what I heard was fair is not always equal and equal is not always equitable but we have a responsibility to each and every student to ensure opportunity and access. Um, and so um, that's what I heard from you, uh, from your definitions of what equity is. Uh, and when you highlighted what equity is, you also al illuminated what equi equity was not. So um, thank you for that piece and I'll leave you with um, what the Dudley Flood Center has defined as educational equ equity and we say that equity reflects a state in which every person's identity power opportunity and potential are fully realized and life outcomes are no longer predicted by characteris characteristics such as race economics ethnicity location, gender, nor disability. Um, and so from what I heard here today, equity is care in action. Um, and that's the reason why we have to be so focused um, on this work uh, and have a true working definition as a group because definitions matter. Definition sets out how intentional we are going to be about ensuring opportunity and access. And when um, Mary Ann highlighted the pieces of your strategic plan that call that out, the pieces of your instructional framework that call, call that out, your current path is setting you up to close those achievement gaps because academic gaps only exist when there are opportunity gaps. And so you need to continue down that path. And so we just encourage you to, to continue um, doing the work because equity um, does matter. And it seems like we have agreeance in the room, so we don't have to spend a lot of time uh, going through that today. <laughs> and I love what you captured, Deanna. Um, it also goes back to what you're most proud of. And so remembering as we're doing this work, there's already parts of it that you already are proud of and lifting up is some of your strongest work, right? Um, so I think that's, I love that connection as well. Um, we do want to transition just a little bit to who are the people in your community, and you've mentioned many of those, right? And so part of this work, I think, is really understanding the, the different people, the different communities, the different cultures that all represent Granville County and represent because our schools do serve all the people in the county, right? So on that same piece of paper, just lower, you won't get a chance to do quite as much um, the little small groups, we're gonna do more big group, but just jot down who you would say are the people in your community, the communities in your community, and the cultures that are part of your community.
Does anybody want to share some of the people you started to list? I love that you're all still going. Um, who are some of the people, communities, and cultures that you know are represented um, in this Granville County community? You say the cultures of the various communities. You know, I I do live uh, in a, a rural area, mm -hmm. and you know, I, um, I do know being in a rural area some of the things that uh, I would have to lead to. Let's just say this: I have I have a cell phone out there. Half the time, I'm not getting any, <laughs> and it's just not. You know, yeah. I call, I can't get service out there, and they just said. Well, we haven't really gotten out there yet, you know, yeah. Verizon, of Spectrum, course. those companies, you know, mm -hmm. and they base it on, they don't want to put out the funds to make that community. So in the rural communities, you will find uh, a diff the culture of not having access. Mm -hmm. And we get back to that having access because that's where you're out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, in the communities we have, um, and I know this too when I've gone to some of the other districts too, you know, they said, well, this community or this culture in this community, we're finding that we, you know, we're bringing in a lot of uh, Hispanics are coming in too, you know. Yeah. So we know that Randall County is huge, and we know that on the, uh, the growing <coughs> side, you know, Wake County is completely different than on the side that about to touch Virginia. It's yeah, very, very different. Very yeah. different. I'm so glad you brought that up because I wasn't even really thinking about that, and yet. I do think that the rural is a really an important community culture. Um, However, I don't know which category even, right? But it is really important that we recognize that. Any other communities or cultures you'd like to call out that you see as being important in our community here? Well, uh, my community is rural also, and I, I live, actually live in the country. <laughs> so we don't have a well, you know, I listed blacks, white, and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. My next door neighbor is a Hispanic couple, I mean, family, really. But uh, another thing that, that I find that's changed is we don't communicate with neighbors, <laughs> in, where I live anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't really get to know, I know them as per people, but I don't know their culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do things differently. They have different kinds of outdoor activities that I see that, I mean, I be, I'm like, well, I probably wouldn't do that, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that's important. And you've mentioned several different communities, even in your rural community, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think about that or cultures, any others that you all want to mention? I like to think about family structure. Uh-huh. We've got single parent families. We've got mm -hmm. parents. Yeah. And, and that's a big part of the big community that I think affects our kids. Absolutely. Linda? I'd say you're economically disadvantaged uh -huh. is a fairly large community in our county. Uh -huh. Then you have the wealthy and then you have the folks sort of in the middle. Uh -huh. so, and you can see a lot of different uh, social things you see traits and how they spend their time, how they spend their money. I mean, they're just the children, what maybe they are able to wear to school or not able to wear to school. A lot of differences. And I think we could keep going on and on. Like I know when I was on the school board, we had great um, connections with the business community, with the faith-based right. community, right? With um, just all those different that are actually communities in the community and cultures in the community and even people who grew up here and those that didn't, right? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we have these, um, all these people represented and we serve as school districts, right? All of them. And so I'm and, gonna, oh, go ahead, Deanna. And just to add on to this piece, I think like we, like central to this equity conversation is this point of how most of us have envisioned community from our time mm -hmm. has changed. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing? So the question that I wanna leave us with is like, what are we doing to address the various community needs? How are we engaging yes. with each respective community, either going to them in certain situations or uh, being more intentional about how we welcome them here? So that's a question um, that I wanna throw out there because community isn't, as it used to be, 
and we just need to think about how we engage in a different way and um, <clears throat> set an expectation that uh, and make sure that our, our intention is that we have multiple, um, I think it was uh, Mr. Perry who was talking about the different pathways in a, another conversation that we were having, but that we have various pathways to engage community so that, so that we also understand more clearly the unique needs of every single student that we serve. And there's almost always a reason if someone doesn't engage. Um, you know, I know how much our schools make the effort for family engagement and parent engagement. And, you know, and sometimes it's hard if you don't feel like someone's engaging, but there's always a reason and uh, in my experience. Um, and so as we think about this, you know, to build on Deanna's point, it's how do we create community, create that sense of belonging, which we'll talk a little bit more about, even with, I mean, you all just here in five minutes listed like 15 different ways, right? To think about your community, your cultures, and all of that represented. I did just want to make sure you had a sense of what the state looks like right now in terms of um, economically disadvantaged students versus non-economically disadvantaged versus racial demographics. And then these slides you will know, but it's, I think it's helpful sometimes when we're having these conversations to look at. On the next one, it has the Granville student demographics. So I'll give you a second just to take a look at that. Um, and it would be really fascinating to look at over time, right, how that has shifted, but I didn't have that today. But this is a snapshot. Um, and then the next one is your teacher demographics. And, um, and you know, in a lot of ways, I would suggest you all have a more diverse teacher workforce than a lot of our districts do. And you align in many ways with the student demographics, which is really helpful and important. We know a diverse teacher workforce is so important, but something our entire state struggles with is making sure we have Hispanic teachers. And it is such a low percentage statewide. And so you all having that difference is not unusual, but it's just something to note, um, something to think about <coughs> as we go through this. And just to note, like data does support the fact that um, if, if every student had at least one, educate, one educator of color that represents what their culture is, their academic trajectory is 10 times better than if they never experienced um, an educator of color in their classrooms. And so we do have data uh, that backs that up and we can share that with Dr. McLean at the conclusion of, of this um, presentation for sure. And the other data is that a diverse teaching workforce is good for every single kid in the district. So it makes a difference for white students, for black students, for Hispanic students, and it across the board. So that's the other thing. It goes, it has that impact, but it also has a positive impact on every single student, which is really remarkable. And also, wow, we can really make a difference by continuing to do that. So that is work we're engaged in and we're always happy to talk about too. Um, I'm going to go through these next parts a little bit closer or, or quickly, um, but one of the things is we're trying to support all these students and support people from all these different cultures, and there's a lot of work behind this that we could bring to you at a different day, but I did want to just note a couple things. So if we really want to build resilience and support positive outcomes for students, we know that those warm, responsive relationships are really, really important, right? And you all mentioned that when I said, what are you most proud of? So that's something you're already starting to do. Um, we also know a safe, stru safe, structured environment aligns again right with your health and safety on your strategic plan is something that is very, very important. And so while we won't spend a ton of time today, I did just want to connect this back to some of the research um, about that sense of belonging. Oh, I want to do this one too. Sorry. Yes. You want to talk about that one, Deanna? Oh. Yeah. No, I want the picture one that you just had. Yeah. One more. <laughs> Two more. Yeah, go forward. Sorry. I'm sorry, guys. We're just uh, doing this very seamlessly. Um, so children need to feel safe, right? We know that. You have that in your strategic plan in order to learn. Like our brains shut down if we're scared, right? And it can sometimes last if you're scared for many hours beyond the incident that scared you. Your brain literally can't learn new things. 
Um, so we need children to feel safe physically, socially, and academically, right? That's really important. So what are things that help? Those of you that have had children or grandchildren or been around children, you know structure, consistency, right? Predictability, warmth, encouragement, reassurance. But we know those relationships are such a part of it. And so to sum it up, it's do I feel seen and heard here? So we want kids to feel seen, to feel heard in those classrooms, in those schools every single day. And so as you all think about who are those kids in our, in our schools, that matters for learning and that matters for their sense of safety. And on the next slide, you know, we'll connect it back to this sense of belonging. Um, and I just think sometimes we don't think about, you can't just ask a kid who's feeling stressed or not safe in some way to turn all that off and then their brain is ready to take in, you know, honors biology, right? It just doesn't work that way. Pre-calculus, like that's not how it works. But it also doesn't work that way when we're talking about learning like early literacy in first grade, right? And so there's so many things that can get in the way. So making sure we have that environment where kids have that sense of belonging. And that does go back to the cultures and the communities that are in our schools. We have to make that connection. That is brave work, that is hard work, but it matters. It's not a special activity, it's not, you know, it is, has to be part of what we do in our schools, and it is worth time and all of that. And just to add to that piece, like, anytime I see this, I'm just reminded that representation matters. You get a sense of belonging <laughs> by uh, seeing those around you that look like you, that are from your same culture, et cetera, because then you can aspire, you know what you are trying to aspire to be. So representation and aspiration matters. Absolutely. So does anyone have any thoughts on what this does look like in our schools and in our work? Um, I can think of a lot of ways, but I really want you to think, do you see ways that you see this happening? I guess I'll start. I'll, I'll begin just to jar some thinking. We ask at the beginning of each year that our principals take a look at the students they serve in their schools and they do things. They have programs and they meet uh, with their school improvement teams and their teaching teams and they do things in their schools to make their students and their families feel safe and comfortable and a part of their school. We want people to feel that way when they walk through the doors. And so that could look very different from school to school. I love that. And I love, like, the school improvement team as an example has, or has parent representation, right? Has Absolutely. teacher rep. So thinking about the voices that are part of that work with the principal is so important. And um, this is not done, you know, alone on the side. It's literally part of that school improvement team's work with the principal, with the educators work with the principal, the families work with them. And a lot of times, PTAs and others are involved, that's at least right. in my experience. That's so right. I, that's a great, and think about that input is important. <coughs> yeah. I think you have an idea you want to share. No? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Well, I think we, we do some of this, but <coughs> it's sometimes difficult to find the personnel. And that is if you have a large percentage of Hispanic students that move in that do not speak English. Um, not only are you dealing with teaching the language to those students, you are also dealing with maybe parents that are difficult to communicate with unless you have someone on staff that can do that. That's one thing. One thing that we have done, um, we had started a program at West Oxford what do we call it? Spanish. Dual language. I couldn't think of that. I knew it was like. It's a dual language program, and it takes the children up through fifth grade, and it takes time for the results to show that there is research back in that, that it helps those students score much better academically when they're in that type of program. But that's a very difficult thing to duplicate every school. So there, that's a challenge. But strong efforts that and it also benefits all the students, right? So whether you're an English 
primary English speaker or you came in with English as your second language, um, I think it, it's interesting that the results are stronger for, for all those kids, right? But it does take a little time. So I appreciate that. So when I heard what you all were proud of, you also talked a lot about relationships and knowing your community. And so don't ever think that it doesn't have to have a formal name or it doesn't have to be an official program to be part of that community outreach and work. But one thing I will say is I have noticed that sometimes that's the space where we don't see, sometimes we might not see parent engagement or we might not see other things. And so finding those critical liaisons or people who can just help us create that bridge because there is a, in my experience, there's a strong desire to be engaged by families that maybe aren't engaging as much or communities that aren't yet engaging or know they might have a language barrier right now, but how do we help bridge that? So thinking about ways to bridge, to make people feel welcome, to have representation. Um, none of it's, I'm not saying that's simple work, but I do think it's really important work that you all have all referenced in different ways and really appreciate that. So as we round out our time today, we want to talk about what, what's next. Um, and so if Dr. Flood was, was here, he always frames things in what, so what, now what. So we have, we have already gone over the what, we have already gone over the so what, and now we get ready to go over the now what. And as you begin to continue to do your work, as your new superintendent begins his work, we encourage you to stay your path. Um, we also encourage you to think about uh, how to incorporate more social competencies within the work that you're doing because student mental health needs are on a, on a, on the rise because uh, because the pandemic has forced like more social media, et cetera. So think about ways that we can engage students uh, more directly to help support them in that way. Um, we were encouraged to see your alignment with the State Board of Education's plan with the focus on equity and the whole child, not just, you're focused on the whole child. Uh, so keep up that work. And as Dr. Flood says, like we will get there. We do have a video uh, that we will play in his own words because he can say it better than, than I. value of diversity. Uh, we still encounter people who don't fully understand its value. And here we were in a gathering of people of all ages, all races, all bits. Our purpose was to understand how valuable it was <clears throat> to have different opinions, different perspectives, different understandings. And when you heard the stories of people who had lived through instances which the younger people would not have had any, any experience in, and then when you heard from the younger people the rejection of a, what they're now doing and what they perceive can be done and ought to be done and just be done, you realize we're still children of the best. We're still living in a world that's coming. It's not fully really here. And one blessing that I have is the blessing of having lived a long time. And when I look at a specific experience from where we came to where we are, I know we can get to where we are. I know that. I don't have to wonder about it. We're gonna rock out to that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so as we conclude up today, as we conclude today, you have a, a great working framework in your instructional framework in your um, strategic plan. I also encourage you to explore um, our framework for change to make sure that you are incorporating the core competencies of modeling, examining, researching, investing, preparing, and convening, which is that, that gets us to that making sure that we are equitable at all times. Um, make sure that you are embracing these, and we can go into a, a, a longer conversation with this at a later time since we are, since we are at time and we like to uh, end on time today. So uh, with what we have shared with you today, what next steps do you see or identify 
that you will embrace as a result of what you have heard here today. So we like to always give you information, but when we give you information, the next part that is um, critical is your commitment, your action to follow through. So if you had to name one thing that you were going to pursue as a, as a result of today, what would that be? I guess to make, um, be more intentional in trying to embrace, encourage, and respect those who are different so we can move forward as a team, as a community, as a system. Thank you. I'd like to see us, we talk about the total <coughs> child a lot, but what is the total child? What, what things influence that? Um, the environment? child's in and many times we don't know what that environment is and ways that we can help children I know the uh, the state is interested in providing more in social workers and th things like that which hopefully will help some but there is a lot of depression with children these days um, the statistics across the United States are just gruesome yes. and it's concerning and many times it's not just an economically disadvantaged family, I mean, family. It crosses an all, all lines. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's concerning and I think we have to pay attention to. I think making sure that equity is built into the norm of what we do. Just, you know, just, it should come as, uh, as often as whatever we do, it should be built in when we're considering doing things. also been a lot of focus on data and data has its good points and then it's not everything but at the same time when we do try things really monitor are they being effective to help the children and change course when it's not mm -hmm. and to that point the part about data that that second piece to researching in that equity framework like really points to the importance of like looking at the data but then like really pulling it apart so that you know how like you need to act and how you need to adjust to meet the changing needs um, that happen within one school year to the next. So that's a great point. Yes. And I was gonna also comment on that part, which is also ask students, ask mm -hmm. parents, ask teachers. Um, students will <coughs> tell you <laughs> what they need, what they're seeing, what they're hearing. If they feel a sense of belonging and they believe that you sincerely want to know. And I know you all do that in a lot of ways, but I continue to think it's a space that we can do more um, just across the board. So this isn't about here at all. Um, but just as you're building those relationships, ask questions. And um, it's kind of remarkable. I feel that it's great too that the if you have the students that feel comfortable that they, they would like to share you know share it with you and they have to have that sense of you caring for them to share you know that can you know definitely assist all the way around knowing that care keeps coming up Deanna <laughs> We thank you for your time uh, this evening. Are there any questions for us? And just know that we, we are here to support you. Reach out um, and we will come back to individual schools, come back to your board meeting, however you would like us to do it. We are here to support you. Are right, any questions? I have a question. What time is your program on the weekends? Oh, that is such a good question, but I may have to send that to you. I think it's Saturday at 7.30. Um, if I may confess, I don't like watching myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes if I have not sleeping and I yeah. wake up in the middle of the night, it's rerunning. So. Yeah, at 5.30 in the morning, and then Fox 50 runs it, and PBS NC runs it on Mondays and Wednesdays. So, And then there's a podcast. So it's very interesting. But I can actually get those for you. So thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> We're so grateful to have you both with us. We know your time schedules are tight. So for us to have had you this evening was a real treat. We are most appreciative. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you.
This sort of concludes our from the meeting. Meeting. We don't really need to adjourn, I guess, from the work session. You don't. Training. So, everyone, have a great week.